glory, 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 glory to the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Praise his holy name forevermore. Welcome to our service, saints. This is going to be part three. Healing is the children's bread. And we're going to talk about many things today. Today's the 5th, March. Actually, actually, May 22nd, the 22nd year of our Lord. And we give the Lord Jesus Christ all the praise on and the glory for that. And we're going to get started right away because we've got much, much to cover today. And if you have your summary sheets and the power of consent and what that meant, remember what consent's all about. What are we consenting to? Get your uh, summary sheets out from last week. We'll go over that in a moment. We have to consent. We consent to have our Lord to take care of us. It's as simple as that. Remember, we're the ones who have dominion over all the earth. Therefore, we literally have to give him, the Lord, permission by our authority to take care of us or else he assumes we want to take care of ourselves. We don't want that. In every area and every situation in life, if we don't invite him into our affairs, the Lord assumes you don't want, he assumes that you want to take care of yourself without his help or assistance. That's crazy, isn't it? So when we give our authority back to the Lord, we are also giving him full autonomy to do what he wants to do and how he wants to take care of us, amen, and the way he wants to do it. So what do we do or say? We say, Lord, I consent. And then Tell them whatever it is that you want to be consented about, that you're giving your consent to. I consent that you are a father unto me, that you are a God unto me, you are a lover and a caretaker unto me. Amen? I consent to be healed by your glorious stripes. I consent to be healed by the precious blood and thy holy word that says, by his stripes I've been healed and made whole. I thank you, Lord, that I acknowledge that death has been abolished and everlasting life and immortality is flooding my entire body and all my flesh, and I consent that you minister that unto me through the power of the Holy Spirit within me. And those scriptures are 2 Timothy 1 and 9 and 10, Matthew 6.32 and 6.33, where it says that the Father knoweth what things you have need of before you even ask, but he needs your consensual power and authority in order to make distribution of those things unto you. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And Proverbs 4, verse 20 through 24, we talked about that last week, that the word of God is medicine to all your flesh and healing for your whole physical body in every shape, manner, and form. Praise God for that. Now the last two paragraphs of last week's summary sheet on the power of consent. You can start declaring by stating, Lord, I consent to have you, and I put as in the summary sheet, dot, 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 because you can make any sentence up that you want or that you have a need of that the Lord will take care of you for. Lord, I consent to have you financially bless me exceedingly abundantly above all I could ask or think. Amen. According to the power that worketh in me in the power of love and through the Holy Ghost. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Or another example, or Lord, I give you my consent. I give my consent that you listen to this and thank you for mightily delivering me from this situation that you may be going through. Or an event, okay, situation or event that may be making a presentation against you. That I don't already have the victory. I do have the victory. You've already given it to me from the foundation of the world. So I consent that you walk that, that power for me into that victory and I'm not going to submit to anything that is contrary to victory. Victory means victory. I don't have any loss. I don't suffer loss. I don't consent to a loss. I don't cave into a loss. I don't, you know, I don't want to receive it in any shape, fashion, or form. Amen. And those verses are Colossians 1, 12 and 13. 1 John 1, 4, 4, which says, you know, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be unto God, which always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, just as a reference, <clears throat> I'm going to turn to Colossians, since I'm there, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. That's one of the key verses of consent. I'm going to read it to you why we have it. Giving thanks unto the Father. That means every time you give him thanks, it's for something that he's already given you. Okay, there's been an exchange made. 
giving thanks unto the Father, which hath, past tense, already done, already made me able to be a partaker, a partaker, I consent, okay, to become what? A partaker of what? It says it right here, clearly. To become a partaker of my inheritance. Those are given to the saints that walk on the light of the gospel. Amen. I consent, Father, that you, and thank you that you have delivered me from the powers of darkness and translated me into the kingdom of the Son of your love. It's, I thank you. And I give you consensual power and authority to minister unto me the benefits that come through that. I'm not of this natural world. I'm not of Satan's kingdom. I'm not part of his possession or ownership anymore. I'm all yours. Amen. Last paragraph. <clears throat> Remember, since all things are already yours, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21 through 23, all things are already yours. So you don't have to fight for victory, you fight from victory, and you run an intruding spirit off of your possessions and your affairs. Since all things are already yours, you are simply consenting to have the Lord assist you with his mighty power to give unto you your inheritance that Jesus already died and paid the price for and his death, burial, and resurrection for you. Amen. This takes the pressure off of you and allows you to receive effortlessly that which is already yours. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Remember that. All things are already yours. We already have all things. We're not trying to fight. We're not trying to have faith for it. We're not trying to believe for it. You just have it. So you make declarations and you give God consent to bring it forth those things that he's already bought and paid for and already given to you specifically and personally through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. So, let me give you a couple more things to work with and then examples. If, we, if you remember last week, we talked about, <clears throat> you don't have to turn to these verses. I'm going to quote them and give you the background of them. At Matthew 18, verses 13 and 14, where we talked about God, Jesus had before him the 99 sheep, but one went astray. When I was looking at that this morning, the Lord said, look up the word astray. I already knew what it meant, but he was, look it up. And the bottom line is astray means this, okay? You're off the, you're off the right path that you should be on. You need to uh, stay the course, but you went off of it. You were given a course direction, but then you veered off of it. And now you need to go back in, into the right direction so that you're, you're not going to be in a place where things are going to hurt you. Okay, so that's very important. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. God bless you, Julie. Thank you for that note. <clears throat> Alrighty. We believe with you. All right, now, listen to this carefully. In the Old Testament, it was incumbent upon you to believe for things. Remember, Jesus said, remember, everything in the Gospels is under the Old Testament still. The New Testament really did not start until Jesus rose up from the dead. So right there at the tail end of the Gospels, and starting with the book of Acts on, that's where the New Testament really began. And the Old Testament, you had to believe. And the New Testament, Jesus has to believe for you. What a benefit, what a switch, amen? And the New Testament also, we are already our believers. By nature, by design, okay? Amen. We have a divine nature. It's already done. You may say, well, Pastor, where's that in the scriptures? Okay, let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 5. <clears throat> Amen. Turn there real quickly. Acts, chapter 5, verse 14. If you don't have your Bibles, I'll quote it to you. Hopefully you do. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And it says this. Listen carefully. We're believers, right? And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both men and women. Think about that. Look what he called us there. He said, and believers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, God's blessings are abundant. Notice what he called you and me. Believers. Well, how did we become believers? Why are we believers? How does he know that we're believers? Remember, God goes by the standard of what you became as a new creation in Christ. Christ is our standard on our behalf before the Father today. So when Father looks at you, he looks at the Son of God first to judge how you are. Think about that. What a, what a blessing that is and takes a lot of pressure off you and me 
to walk, you know, on eggshells. We don't have to do that. In the Old Testament, we had to. Under the New Testament, that's not necessary. Jesus is our performance, our conduct, and our obedience before the Father on our behalf. Thank God for that. It's called grace. Amen? Thank goodness. So we're called believers there. Why? Because when Jesus took up residence within us, when we became born again and filled with the Holy Ghost and became a believer in Christ through his eternal life being imparted unto us, that came into you and me. He came into you and me. And he's a believer. Your old nature got kicked out, which was in union with a satanic foe, Satan, who was an unbeliever. And then a new person came in who is a believer, and that is the Spirit of the Lord, the Son of the living God, Jesus himself, through the power and instrumentation of the Holy Ghost. So he's in you right now. So you are a believer already. You're not a doubter, okay? You're not filled with any unbelief at all. You, by nature, are believers. Now, why? if only somebody would have preached that to me on day one, you know, some 35, 40 years ago, I would have had it made. I struggled for decades trying to get my faith to a certain level so that I would always believe and not doubt that there would not be one scintilla of doubt in me. Well, I was off, off the mark. It's not, in the New Testament, it's not based on you, it's based on Him again. It's based on Jesus, it's based on your standing that you have in Him positionally. He's your representative on your behalf before the Father. Now, does He have faith? Perfect faith. Does He have belief? Perfect belief. Does He always believe? Absolutely. Does He ever waver? No. So get yourself out of your own identity from what you used to be in your fallen state and get yourself over into your new identity in Christ Jesus where you are a believer all the time. And you always walk by faith all the time because see, when he evicted the old nature and you became the new nature in Christ, God goes by the faith of the Son of God for you to use today. Not your faith, which can fail miserably. He gave you the Son of God's faith. And then he also deposited within you his love nature. Well, I don't know if I can walk in love, Pastor. The Bible says that the love of God has already been shed abroad in your heart and deposited in your heart at the new birth by the, through the instrumentation and glory of the Holy Spirit. He put it in you already. Now all you have to do is yield to it and make a decision to yield to that rather than what? Succumb to your carnal desires to lash out and say something different. Okay? So that's significant. So it says here, and the believers were added, not the doubters, not, not the people who couldn't get saved, but believers. Let's give you another example. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 4. Hallelujah. And it says here this. <clears throat> It says here, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Look what it says there, be an example of the believers. So you're called a believer. The Christians are called believers because of our new identity, because of our new nature, okay, of that which we became in Christ Jesus. It's all new. The Bible says, you know, we became a new creation in Christ the moment we accepted him. All things passed away. Take it to the curb, take the garbage to the curb, and leave it there. Don't ever take it back. All things became new because you became a new individual in Jesus. That's good preaching, saints. That's good news. Amen. All right, let's continue here. Now, I said this earlier a moment ago. All things are already yours, and we are possessors of everything already. I can't stress how important that is. Instead of struggling and saying, well, I don't know if I ask God, will he listen to me? It's too late for that. The minute Jesus died and gave you the, his last will and testament, like any other testament here in the natural, somebody were to die, you have all the inheritance listed therein. Well, Jesus died and gave you the full Bible, and it already became yours. He can't take back what he already died for and gave you already. Okay? So all things are already yours. There's no need to petition. There's no need to struggle. There's no need to ask. It's already done. Amen. 
Hallelujah. All things are already ours, and we are possessors of everything. Now, why is that so significant? And now, if you want a verse for that, again, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. And another good verse, and I'll quote it to you, is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where it says that all the promises of God that have been given to us are already yes. So every promise that God has already distributed into his word, the moment Jesus died, they became yes to you. It's like somebody dying, if your parent died and you go to the lawyer's office and you have the will probated, and you said, I, I want paragraph 2, line 3, where it's consented unto me to receive that, then it's given unto you. There's no argument there. The person's not going to come back from the grave and say, no, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to give it to them. Well, Jesus did come back from the grave, not to take it away from you, but to make sure you got it. Okay, to be a surety, to be a guarantor of those things that he bought and paid for you on your behalf. Amen. Another good verse is Second uh, Peter. Well, let's turn there. It's right after Timothy, uh, or the book of Hebrews, where we were. Book of Hebrews is next, and then Second Peter is right after that. And let's look at verse one or chapter one verses three and four excuse me second peter chapter one verses three and four hallelujah god is good amen god is good now let's read that together here according to his divine nature look at this wording here according as look at what it says as his divine nature hath given unto us all things so you own all things He's given unto us all things that pertain to this life that you're going to need in this life. And godliness, walking in a godlike manner and a godly manner because of your new image and likeness and who your new identity is in Christ. Amen? You can walk in a godlike manner because of who's representing you and, and how you're being represented by Jesus before the Father. Amen? Hallelujah. How does that happen? It comes through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue and power. He's called you. How do you obtain the knowledge? Get your mind into this word. Find out what your inheritance is all about. Don't go a day without finding every jot, tittle, and semicolon of the benefits that God gave you through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection by that precious blood. Look at verse 4. Whereby are given unto us, look at that wording, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises and that by these you might be a partaker. <laughs> okay, You can partake of things that were already granted unto you, right? You can't become a partaker of things that you don't own or don't have or not in possession of. You can only be a partaker of those things that you do have, the things that you do own, the things that you are a possessor of. Amen? That by these you might or are able now to be a partaker of the divine nature. Oh, we can partake of the divine nature of God because guess what? We are partakers of that nature that is now within us. He gave us what? His divine nature. Amen. Amen. He gave us His divine nature. Having escaped the world, the corruption that is in this world, through lust. Okay? This world system sees everything through their eye gates, their sense gates, and trying to acquire things because they're in fear of not being able to have them or they could lose them. God says, no, I'm your father. I'm going to make and give you the insurance and guarantee that you're not going to have to seek those things that way. I'll lavishly pour, pour them upon you. All you have to do is give me your focus, devotion, and attention, and I'll be a father unto you. Amen? What I want you to see here is the fact that all these things have been already been given unto us, number one, and that number two, you have been made a partaker of his divine nature already. You have a not a natural nature, not a normal nature inside you, but a divine nature, that nature of that of Christ, the Son of the living God. So all things are possible to you now who can believe. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. <clears throat> Simply consent to partake. Okay? Simply con consent to partake of all these things that have been, or that pertain unto me through life and godliness. Simply consent to uh, partake of these precious and exceedingly great promises. Simply consent to partake of the divine nature. Consent to it and walk in it. Amen.
Are you trying to tell me that some of these things can fall, you know, come to me like ripe cherries falling off of a tree? Absolutely. As long as you consent to it. Father's not withholding. Remember, the testator died. Jesus died already. He already gave it to you. You can't deny what you already have. Amen? <coughs> Let's go on here. If we have to struggle, struggle to get something in your mindset, okay? If you have to struggle to get something, you're in the Old Testament still in your mindset. Don't go there. Don't struggle. Just think. Think. The Bible in the New Testament is a book of thanksgiving because the testator died. The minute the, if your parent were to die and leave you an inheritance, you don't have to go to the gravesite and beg, borrow, and steal, and, you know, and try to get things. It's there. It's already been given unto you. All you do is say thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Because it's already done. It's already yours. Jesus already died. It's already done. It's already yours. We give our consent to walk in that which the Lord has given us through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We already covered that in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Now, in the New Testament, it's as though we are back in the Garden of Eden before the, before the fall of Adam. Adam had everything, and Father lavishly, look at this, and Father lavishes love and provision to him and on him profusely. Amen. He was spoiled. Amen. Amen. If Adam wanted to accept something from the Father, he simply consented to it and enjoyed its benefits. I'll say that again. If Adam wanted to accept something from the Father, he simply consented to it and enjoyed its you know, sweet benefits. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. It was pure grace in the garden. It was pure love. Father enjoyed the position of a lover, caretaker. Amen. That is something that the fall of Adam deprived our father of. Now we can have it back. He's already given it to us. He wants us to walk in it. Hebrews 4, 3 says that, you know, we who believe do enter into the rest of Almighty God because he already gave us all things since the foundation of the world. God's given us all things richly to enjoy. It's already ours. That's what the faith walk is about. Lord, I believe you. I believe the integrity of your word. I know that you can't lie, so it must be real. And if you lie, that you would destroy yourself and the entire creation and universe would be gone. So if you said it's already mine, I just simply thank you. And now I consent that you what? Manifest it into me in this natural world so I can enjoy its sweetness and its benefits. You see that? Don't make it harder than that. Accept the kingdom as a little child would. The kingdom is already within us and among us, and everything in the kingdom of God is perfect. It's full. Its supply is full. Its provisions are full. Everybody there is walking in the joy of the Lord. Everybody's walking in, in great posterity, prosperity, financially as well, if necessary. I know that there's not a coin of the realm that you need to buy things there, but the throne of gold is made of gold, and so are the streets paved of gold. I mean, God doesn't have an inferiority or poverty conscious nor does he want his children either. And he said, they will be done in the earth the same way it's done in heaven. So he wants to lavish these things on you so you don't have the pressures of life to be on you to be a distraction, to steal from your attention and focus that he wants for, for himself. God can be a jealous God. He wants you. He wants your attention. He wants your you know, focus. He wants your devotion. He wants you to love on him too. But he, more expressively, he wants to pour that love upon you over and over. That's how our God operates. Praise the Lord forevermore. Amen. So he's already done all these things from the foundation of the world, and we thank him for it. Now, if you have a necessity or a need for physical healing, simply say this, Lord, Father, I consent to walk in the blessings of Jesus' healing stripes, according to 1 Peter 2.24. Now, since we're in Peter, just back up a chapter or a book, <clears throat> go to 1 Peter 2.24, and let's look at God's intention here for you and for me. It says in verse 24 of the second chapter, who, talking about Jesus, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, <clears throat> that we now be in dead to sins, he annihilated sin. All of it, past, present, and future, has been annihilated by the blood and by the stripes and by the glory of the finished work of the cross. Amen? That we should now live unto our rights. 
our Bill of Rights, our Christian Constitution, which is this book, this Bible, the last will and testament of God's inheritance to you and to me. Amen. We shall live unto the right standing that God gave you and me, that we are now sinless beings standing before him. Well, Pastor, you know, I do sin every once in a while. There's an occasion that that may happen. That's okay. The blood of Christ is outside of time. It's in eternity. The cross was 2,000 years ago. You know, and it covers all the people that will be born way after us as well if they want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. That blood is a perpetual thing. The moment you got saved, not only this, all the sins that you did from the time you came out of the birth canal, if that's possible, all the way to the time you were, you know, saved, were covered. But from that point, moment on, infinitum, till we go home to be with the Lord, either in the rapture or otherwise, all your sins are covered. That gives you liberty. That gives you freedom. That lifts your consciousness from a burden that you cannot handle or carry. There is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. You know, to have a conscience free from the burden of worry or fear liberates you to have faith. Okay, you don't have the bars of condemnation holding you down or locking you up. You've escaped. The Lord's opened up the door. He tore the hinges off the jail cell. Come out from among them and walk in your inheritance. Amen. Hallelujah. So it says here, his own self bear our sins in his own body. That we being dead to sin, don't be sin conscious, be righteousness conscious. God said that I'm a sinless being because Jesus is now the one who's taken up residence within me, so I believe him. What God says, I believe it, and that settles it. I'm not going to get into an argument of mode with my brain because God, let God's word be true and every else man a liar. So tell your mind to shut up, I believe the word. I have my new identity, Jesus is perfect. If I don't say he's perfect, if I don't say I'm perfect, I'm saying he's not perfect because God and, and me are now what? One together. We're the, he's the head and we're the body. The head is attached to the body, the body to the head. Amen. And we're the body of Christ. So I'm not going to you know, insult my Father, my Lord Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost by saying that I'm still walking around in sin. You know, if you still got that thing rattling around in your brain and it's weighing you down, just simply say, Lord, I thank you that your mercy, you know, you're merciful to my unrighteousness and my sins and my iniquities you remember no more, that your blood is perpetual, it's eternal, it's constantly rinsing me all the time. I'm in a state underneath the waterfall of your glory. You know, this waterfall of the blood is constantly splashing on you hard. In the old example we gave many, you know, years ago, if let's say you were outside, you know, pl you know planting some flowers in the soil and you had some dirt on your finger and you came in and you put the sink on high and that water comes rushing out of the faucet and you had the soap there and just takes all that dirt and whatever dirt and remnant you had just blows it away. Now let's say I took some new dirt but I got my finger under the faucet coming down real hard and I put some more dirt on my finger. Just washes it away before it can even attach itself to you. It just blows it away. So you're underneath that waterfall of God right here, right now, today and forever if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That waterfall constantly hits you. So let's say you did a sin. Who cares? Ran into the waterfall and got rinsed off and pushed away. Any future sin that you'll ever make after the new birth, after receiving Christ, washed away immediately. It gets pounded by that waterfall coming crashing down upon you and rinsing you perpetually, keeping you perfect, keeping you cleansed, keeping you, you know, beautiful before the Lord. You're walking in a place of innocence as though sin had never touched you even in the first place. A great place to be, saints. It frees the mind to walk in the enjoyment of God's benefits. See, God's not going by your conduct. He's going by Jesus' conduct. Well, you don't know how ugly I was the other day when I said this or I said that. All that's washed under the waterfall. Past, present, and future conduct. Past, present, and future sin. Past, present, and future disobedience. Things that you didn't walk in. All of it's been rinsed away. And it's always going to be gone. God's looking at Christ when he sees you. He puts you inside of Jesus. But before he can see you, he's got to see Jesus through you, or through him, to you. And all he sees is beauty. He sees perfection. He sees innocence. He sees a perfect righteousness, as though sin had never been. Righteousness is a standard that God has that he judges you based on his own perfection. Think about that. So when God calls you his righteousness in 2 Corinthians 5.21, what he's really saying to you and to me is, Beloved, I'm judging you after the mirror of my own standard of perfection. 
I am righteous, but I gave you my righteousness, so I see you based on the same standard of that perfection. So as righteous as I am, you are. And let me tell you something, God is perfectly righteous. Hallelujah. So let's read this verse again. Whose own self bear our sins on, in his own body on the tree, or the cross, <clears throat> that we be now dead to sin. Like I said, don't be sin conscious, but be what? Righteousness conscious. Live out of the forces of your recreated divine nature, spirit now, that you're the new man. You're a new identity is Jesus. How is Jesus, however Jesus is to you, say that's how he is to me, and that's how I walk today. Is Jesus without sin? Say that's me too. If he's without sin, so am I. Is he perfect? So am I. Is he innocent? So am I. Is he full of power? So do I have that same power. Does he have the glory? I've got that same glory. John 17, verse 21, 2 and 3 says so. Amen. So we now, being dead to sin, should live our lives unto this righteousness factor. And we did a whole teaching on that, a series on that, you know, before. Amen. And our seating in Christ. Those three tiers, remember? The first being the righteousness of God. That we should now live under this righteousness. I've got a right to live free. I've got a right to live healthy. I've got a right to live wealthy. I've got a right to live, you know, with favor upon me. That no matter what I do, no matter what I see, no matter whom I touch, I'm blessed, they're blessed. I walk a life of success and victory all the time. That's part of my righteousness and part of my favor that I have in this world. I have a right to walk in this glory. Amen. I have a right to walk in this empowerment. I have a right to always be blessed and to walk in this triumph and success all the time. That's my birthright. That's part of my inheritance here. Oh, nobody's ever preached it to me that way or taught me. Well, then you were sitting under the wrong person. This is what the scripture says. It's right in front of us. Let's read the last sentence here. That we should live unto our rights or our righteousness and by whose stripes, talking about Jesus' stripes, the stripes that he took at that whipping post, <clears throat> you know, the ten, what was the name of that uh, movie that uh, Mel Gibson was in? Passion. The Passion of Christ, was it? Remember that beating that you saw Jesus take? Well, multiply that by another ten, maybe a hundredfold. The scripture says that his bones, all of his bones were bare and showing. Think about that. That means all the skin was torn off. So he took all the beating, all the torment that you should have been given as a judgment based on the sin walk that we had. Father poured all of his wrath, all the aggravation that you put him through based on the sinful life that you walk and we're walking before you got born again. He laid it all upon Jesus. All of his flesh got torn off and he laid with his ribcage bare to the world because he wanted to make sure every you know sin and scintilla of sin will be laid upon the back and stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Father says in this verse here, by whose stripes or the stripes of Jesus Christ you were healed. I'm talking about physical healing here. Okay, solical or mind or mental healing as well. Healing for your finances, healing for your family, healing for your loved ones. And notice the verbiage there, by his stripes you were. You're not trying to acquire. People who are possessors already are walking and were. Not going to, not going to have. I, the Bible says we were. We're looking back to the cross that happened 2,000 years ago. Based on what happened there, you were healed, son. You were healed, daughter. You were healed, my beloved. It's already a finished product. It's part of your inheritance. It's already it's part of those things that say all things are yours. So we don't have to struggle for you know physical healing. By his stripes you were. If you were, you are. If you are, you is. You is, you am. You can't get any more healed than that. So walk in the sweetness of it. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the power of these verses. I could talk about this verse, believe it or not, for several hours, but we won't. Let's just keep this go on here further. Here's another example. Say, I consent to be paint free in Jesus' name. I consent to it now. Okay? As Jesus is now pain free. Hey Jesus, are you pain free? Yep, son. Okay. I consent to that. Whatever he gets, I get. I'm a joint heir and heir of all that. Romans eight seventeen says. Eight sixteen and seventeen. 
Okay, I'm an heir of the God the Father. I'm an heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, are you pain free? I mean, this is how you should be acting all day. Jesus, are you pain free? Yes, son, I am. Well, then I'm pain free too because I'm one with you. You're the head and, and I'm the body of Christ. Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. The scripture says in 1 John 4, 17, as you are now pain free, so am I in this world. As you are now in this world and any, you know, in heaven and in all your veracity and all your glory and all your standing, and beauty and holiness and power, so am I in this world. As you are now in perfect love, so am I in this world. Perfect love. Amen, saints? So, whenever you're going through a situation, run it through him first. Hey, Jesus, um, do you have any debts that you're worried about? No, son, they're all paid for. Oh, okay, then I'm debt free. You talk to those bills and said, Jesus paid this debt for me by his stripes, by his with the, the punishment that he took on the cross for me, and I'm debt free? You know, he's emancipated me from all bondage whatsoever financially, no matter what it is. For my God has met all of my needs according to his riches and glory by and through and in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19 says. Amen. Let's continue on here. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Here's another one. I consent, Lord. I give you my consent. Okay. To be in the prime of life. And as he is now. Again. First John 4, 17 says, As Jesus is now, so are you in this world. Hey, Jesus, are you in the prime of life? You died at 33 and a half years old uh, and then went to heaven. And the scripture says, as you are now, as you were when you died here, so am I in this world. Well, then I have to be in the prime of life. Well, how come you're not in the prime of life yet, Pastor? How come it's not retroactive yet? Because I've just started learning this. And I'm starting to put the pressure on the scripture now. And I'm starting to believe Jesus to reverse all these situations. Well, can you really do it as a scripture? We've gone over this infinitum before. You know it is. In the millennial reign, which is in our near future, those people live to be a thousand years old. Why not now? Okay, Adam would still be alive if he'd never sinned and he'd be over 6,000 years old. The body was designed by God to never die. Every seven years, your cells regenerate and they replenish and they were supposed to be in a perpetual eternal state of excellence for you okay <clears throat> i can't get into the details that are in too many other series that we've done trust me it's very scriptural but we should be in the prime of life and now i'm going to say something here you really need to get a hold of this now <clears throat> when am i going to be in the prime of life when i you know put a lot of pressure in the scripture petition heaven you know, when I tell God I consent to be walking in the prime of life, no, listen to me. You got to sell yourself out that the scriptures are true. Ephesians five thirty says that we are today bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, Jesus's, and as He is now, a perfect health, at the prime of life, so are we in this world. Now either that scripture's true or He's a liar. I know it's true because the Bible says God cannot lie. So when I look at, if I was looking at an, uh, a room of you know thousands of people, and they were over 33 and a half years old, I would tell all of them, you're in the prime of life, whether you know it or not, whether you are you are experiencing it or not, it's still true. That is absolute truth. You're 33 and a half years old now. Now faith calls those things which be not. You be not, and the natural doesn't look like you're 33, as though they were. Faith calls those things, although you don't seem to be walking in it, as though you were walking in it. Faith calls it into existence by calling what the Word says. Faith always sides in and agree, gets in agreement with what the Word says about you. When you couple faith and agreement with the Word, then God can release that power and whatever that DNA of what you're believing for in that Word then becomes personal to you and you get the sweet benefits of it. So don't say, uh, I'm believing for the prime of life. No, say, I'm already a believer, and therefore I am in the prime of life. And you keep saying it, and you keep declaring it, and you keep making those declarations and, and confessions against the powers of darkness, against the world system. And before you know it, God's going to do a, a new metamorphosis in you and reverse the aging process to where your youth is renewed day by day, the scripture says, and your body parts do not grow old nor worn out. Okay? It takes time to reverse the current of the Niagara River going one way. That's the way you and I were. We were bred to believe one way going down, 
you know, a current of destruction. So now we get our minds renewed to the Word of God, and now we've got to think a different way, a new way, and push it against the magnet, you know, the magnetism of the world system trying to draw us down hell's death throws. So it takes time to develop that. It takes time to get your mind into that place, into that finite state to say, look it, God's Word said it, I believe it, that settles it, and I'm consenting to the fact that I'm in the prime of life. You keep declaring that. Just keep doing it. Before you know it, all of a sudden, you know, somebody's going to say, boy, you're starting to look good. You're, you, look, you look younger. What, what are you doing? Are you using some new nutritional products? You got a new skincare program? All of, all of a sudden, God's word comes into power, into focus. The scripture says not only are we bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh now, but it, the verse above that says that he nourishes and he cherishes his own body. <clears throat> now let me ask you this question this dichotomy that we go through. The head, the head, Jesus, is 33 and a half years old, right? Now, we're the attached body to Jesus. Now, I don't know who has a head and a body that are of a different age. If you're in a room and you're 20, and I'm, your body can't be 15 or your body can't be 40. Whatever your head's age is, your body's age is. It's common sense. Sometimes we over... You know, get over spiritualized things, and they're right in front of us the answers. If Jesus the head is 33, then his extended body, you and me, have to also be 33 and a half years old as well. Okay? Now, how does Jesus see this? Jesus sees you and me as his word says we are. And the sin that was committed in the garden, that Adam saw himself less than what the word said he was. So why are we aging? Because the church are seeing themselves less than what the Word says they are. The Word says we're in the prime of life as He is now, 1 John 4, 17 says. So we're committing the same sin that Adam did. Well, I thought you said sins were washed away. They are, but they still affect your mental ascent, your mental processes, how you actually affect yourself in this natural world. If you don't really believe it, then your body's going to correspond to what your subconscious is really directing you to do. Okay? So start confessing and declaring and saying, I'm in the prime of life as Jesus is now. I give honor to him when I say that. I dishonor him if I don't say that. Let me ask you this then. How come people who have had after-death experiences, they see these people going through, you know, they come out of their bodies, they go through this tunnel, they go up into heaven, and they pass through a membrane, you know, into heaven. Okay? It's almost like a... We used to see Stargate. They would go through the Stargate and come to the other side. And then as soon as they went through that membrane and came to the other side, everybody was young again. Why is that? Because that's the way heaven really sees you and me. That's the way it really is. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is within us and among us, and it's here now, over us. There's no people over 33 and a half years old in heaven. No, there isn't any. And if we're in the kingdom now, and thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven then we should also side in with what the scriptures say. We have not because we don't act in agreement to what the word says you are today, as heaven sees you. We've got to side in with the language of heaven, with the faith of heaven, with the belief in how heaven sees you. They see you through Jesus. Is Jesus 33 and a half? Yep, years old. So am I then in this world. That's it. It's that simple. Don't make it any more complicated than that. Hallelujah, saints. Praise God forevermore. That's why I want you to go over these things several times. We've got two or three more minutes left, and we'll unhook today. I'm going to give you a couple more bombshells here. We never did get to um, faith walketh, worketh by love. Oh, it was a mass, massive revelation and that I needed to give to you, too. There's always next week. All right, let's go over a couple more here. I consent to walk in his divine health. Amen. That means, Lord, lay it upon me in any which way you see fit. We've already gone over 1 Peter 2.24. Matthew 8.17 says, Himself took all your infirmities, your pains, your sorrows, sicknesses, and diseases. And by, okay, himself took them. Himself took it. And we know that, couple that with Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes we were healed. Now here's a verse that I've been wanting to, to share with you and show you. It's Psalm 105, verse 37. 
Now, for all of you who are skeptics of this, okay, remember when you know God took the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Exodus? You know what Exodus means? Not just to being you know coming out of Egypt, which was a form of the world system, but it also means being exited. You're being you know you're going through an exit from one way of thinking and one way of doing and one way of believing to a new way. Okay, and so God said in this verse, let me read it to you, in Psalm 105, verse 37. And this whole chapter, starting especially with, you know, I believe it starts with uh, uh, verse 23. I'm talking about how Moses brought these people out. Okay? As they were coming out, look at this verse. He says, And God brought them forth out of Egypt with silver and gold. You know, isn't it interesting he said that? He could have said it with health and healing first. No, God puts a premium on wealth. Get, you know, get this poverty consciousness out of your head. God despises poverty, lack. It's part of the curse that he redeemed you from, okay? God brought them forth with silver and gold. Whose? All of the Egyptians. They laid it upon them. There's several verses on that we could go over. Look at this part. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. There was 12 tribes of Israel. Not one feeble person. One disabled, one crippled, one halted, one maimed, one lamed. You see, you know, like we talked about Charleston Heston and the Mo, you know movie Moses and all that, and they're coming out and on crutches and you know these built wheelchairs that they had and, and blind and all that's garbage. God healed them all and took all the wealth out of Egypt. That's a shadow and type of the rapture of the of the body of Christ, the church. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. Before the rapture hits, there's not going to be one feeble one among us either. If he did this under the Old Testament, under the law, how much more will he do to the new creation, those who are now one with the Son, Jesus Christ, as we now enter into the millennial reign? The people entering the millennial reign are going to be full of glory, full of health, full of vibrancy, full of youth. So he's not going to have a bunch of older, you know, baby boomer, old agers going into the millennial reign. We're going to go through that memory into that new age of the millennial reign, just as young as everybody there that's going to be. And not one. How many people came out of Egypt, Pastor? A lot of people think that there was at least, at least three million. Okay. Some say men, but what about, and besides women and children, then maybe it's even more, six million. And guess what? None of their animals, which were numerous and innumerable, were they sick or feeble or lame as well. Not one. Not one. This is our God. This is the mentality of how our Father thinks about you. Not one. Not one feeble. Not one who had less strength than the other. All walking in the vibrant prime of life. Do you see it, saints? It's right there. It's right there. Hallelujah. Why don't we unhook it there, and we'll pick it up next week and finish the power of consent, and then we'll get into, um, as remember now, this is healing is the children's bread. We'll definitely get into faith worketh by love. And I'm going to show you that it's got nothing to do with your faith. It's got nothing to do with you walking in your human love. It's all about the faith of the Son of God that you have. It's all about the faith and the love of God that he already deposited within you. And I'm going to show you how to use the boat, you know, the combination of both together to walk into victory with plenty of examples as well. Okay? So we're going to unhook, make a little notation there that that's where we left off, and we'll pick it up next week. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for this time together. <clears throat> I praise you. I bless you. I worship you. I thank you. We give you the praise, honor, and the glory for this message, Father. I thank you that we walk in supernatural retention, memory, and recall of all the things that you've shown us today. We thank you that we are not just hearers, but we're also practicers and doers of what we've heard. That's why it's so important, and I'm going to be sending this out to you today. I'm going to send it to your email. I'm also going to send it to you uh, by phone, and so you know you can have it right on your iPads or your phones as well. After. Uh, my son uploads loads it to uh, the internet through YouTube. 
and you're going to have it. I want you to go over it over and over because you have to get this down. I don't want these truths just banging around in your mind like a ping pong, you know, like we're watching, uh, you know, we got some machines where they play the ping pong stuff all the time and it bounces around in your head and you don't have any revelation of it. Okay? I want you to walk in a revelation of it because it's already done. It's already yours. The quickest way to get there is to start saying it. I'm in the prime of life through Christ Jesus. As Jesus is in the prime of life, so am I in this world in the prime of life. Keep saying it. Every time you say it, it builds strength within you to become, believe it more and more. You're already a believer, so say it with conviction, and then you're going to sell out your subconscious to really believe it. Every time you speak a word out of your mouth, it's like a, a seed sown. You sow green beans, you get green beans. You sow prime of life, you're going to get the prime of life growing up within you. Do it, and do it oftentimes. Well, how many times should I do it? Do you start seeing the results? Amen? Well, Pastor, that might be uh, 100,000 times. So, so what? If you can shave, you know, 30 to 50 years off of you, is that so hard to do? Was it worth it? I think so. <clears throat> Let me give you some assurance here as you get your communion ready before you. I'll get before you some a wafer, a cracker, or whatever, and some red grape juice. The Bible says that no word of God can return unto him void. You know what that means? That when we make a declaration before the throne room like that, God's saying, I'm not going to let this word that you spoke to me fall to the ground unheard and unheeded and un undone. I'm going to give it to you. And that's in Isaiah 55, 11. No word of God shall return void of power, but it shall accomplish that which we please and prosper in the thing whereto we've sent it. That's God's promise to you. So open up your mouth and start making these statements. Start making these declarations about what the Word of God says about you is true. And then we're going to have a paradigm shift. Don't forget, the Bible says that before Jesus comes, and it's imminent, we're right there at the door, saints, that death is going to be abolished. I'm talking about physical death. So when that goes out the window, I'm willing to bet we've already got this prime of life thing already solved by the Lord's glory. See, the closer of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth comes, the more his glory, resident glory, tangible glory, falls upon the earth, the landmass, and the people in it. And the more you are in the Lord's glory, the more you, there's more power in and around you available to cause miracles and signs and wonders to happen to you. We're in that day and age now. It's starting to happen in a big way. Prepare yourself for great things. Hallelujah. Okay. If you've got your communion ready, <clears throat> take your bread. This bread, remember now the title of our series is Healing is the Children's Bread. It's right here. Father, say this after me, Father, in Jesus' name, we just praise you, Lord, and I bless you that Jesus is my bread of life. You said as often as we take of this bread and eat it and drink of the cup of his precious blood, we do it in remembrance of him, and Lord, we do it in remembrance of what your word said about him to you and to me and to us. Lord, the Bible says, as Jesus is now, so are we in this world, so that we are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, all of it. All of our internal and external organs and cells, all of our lymph zones and nodes, everything about you, your immune system, your eyes, your ears, your hair, your skin, inside and out, your bones, your heart, your lungs, all internal and external organs and cells, chemical and electrical, glandular and hormonal, teeth, gums, roots, everything about you is that of the Lord Jesus Christ now. The Bible says is our youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, our youth is renewed like Jesus. Day by day, so our body parts not grow old or worn out. At the cross, think about this. God took you all your bodily organs and put his bodily organs on top of yours, inside of yours, and made a transformation and a transfer. He took away all your downside and negativity and, you know, infirmity and gave you his divine perfect bodily organs, all of them. You've got to see that. You've got to believe that. That's what communion is. I'm coming into union of what he did for me on that cross. There was a perfect exchange of his divine nature to my bad nature. 
my, to my sin nature, to all my, you know, trampled bodily organs suffering, you know, the law of sin and death under it, to now he gave me what? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and my bodily organs are now vibrant like his are. Amen. Amen, saints. Now, if you believe that, and you should because you're a believer, right? Tell your mind to shut up. Say, I'm a believer. The Bible says so. I believe it. That settles it. I don't care what your head says. Tell it to be quiet. Because you're a believer, receive that. Accept it as done, and receive it as done now in Jesus' name. And if you do that, you may partake of the bread. Hallelujah. Saints, take the cup. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. This blood is before the mercy seat in heaven as an everlasting reminder that we're under the waterfall. That God's plan for you and for me was perfect. Perfect. Forever, eternally perfect. That we're forever, eternally sinless, righteous, innocent before him when we accepted Christ God fitted you took you and put you right inside Jesus's body he sees you perfect in him you're standing before the Father and Christ is secure it's sure it'll never never fail amen the Bible says the precious blood of Christ overcomes the devil over and over as you pound him into submission he's already underneath your feet placed there by father our Father God. We overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony, our declarations. We testify personally to what the Word says that the God, what God has done for you and for me and Christ. Amen. When you receive Christ and a portion of that blood was deposited within you, your spirit is also a container, a holder, or a basin of not only the Spirit of God and the beloved of God and the presence of God, and the anointing, the grace, and all that, and its glory, but also an apportionment of that blood was put in there. And every time you speak words, writing on the back of those words, there's an apportionment of that blood that goes into the area where you want it to go in, and it causes results to correspond positivity and for, your, for your benefit. Know that when you do these things. That's what causes them to work. That's what causes them to be effectual. Amen. Because you're believers, and I know you are, and you have that already, you may partake of the cup. Thank you, Lord. Praise God forevermore. <clears throat> now, saints, we're going to pray over your... Remember I told you that God puts a premium on finances. Okay? J just as much of that whipping post took your healing for your physical body and a portion of, the, of ripping all the skin and bearing all of his rib cage was for your finances to be restored unto you. He destroyed the curse of debt, lack, and poverty. And God wants you to walk in the abundance of all things, so we're going to pray over your finances. So get in front of you your checkbook, your wallet, whatever it is that you have. Lay hands on it as I'm speaking over to you. And also as you sow into the kingdom of Almighty God, and you, God will bless you exceedingly. Amen? God loves a sower. When you sow, he says, okay, you've opened up the door. I'm going to bless you abund exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. Watch him do it, because he cannot be a debtor to a man. You know, there have been some men out there that took God up on a challenge of that. They said, I'm going to outgive God. Okay, so they tried. 
some people um, who were delivered out of foxholes. They said, Lord, you get me out of this situation, I'm going to give you 90% of my income, I'll live on 10, instead of the other way around. Instead of tithing 10, living on the 90. Well, to make a long story short, God delivered them out of an impossible situation. They should have died in a war. They were being overrun by the enemy. Well, the guy gave a vow to God and he kept it. And um, one was J.C. Penney and I think another one was one of the Rockefeller guys. And they gave 90%. And God says, you're not going to outgive me. And he built a super empire for these individuals. I think Rockefeller started the March of Dimes. He goes, I'm going to give every part of my wealth. He was on his deathbed. I think he had tuberculosis. So they had a March of Dimes. That was the initiation of it. I think on Broadway down in New York City, they put uh, dimes you know, next to one another for miles. That's called you know, the March of Dimes. That's how it started. You know, there's like millions of dimes that were out there. The minute he did that and the last dime went down, he got physically healed. Isn't that something? You can't outgive God, and he built him a super financial empire. God's not going to be a debtor to man. Okay? I've tried that a few times when we had um, a few other back, when we had our situation back in 88, didn't have any finances coming in at all. I was still tithing. Okay? My checkbook looked ridiculous. Here, you know, we're just hanging on. Next year, we're making hundreds of thousands of dollars because God said, I'm not going to be a debtor to any man. So don't be in fear. God loves you. He sees Jesus as a billionaire, trillionaire, multi-trillionaire. Confess it. I'm, I'm, as if he's a billionaire, I'm a billionaire too. Do it. you got to start. Let's pray over our finances. Lord, we take this basket of our tithes and offerings and give it to the Lord Jesus Christ who's after the order of Melchizedek, Lord God, over our words and our confession, and we receive a thousandfold blessing and a thousandfold return on our giving. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that this is our day of jubilee, which means total emancipation from all debt, all mortgage, all credit card debt's gone, all credit card debt's gone, all school and college debt, gone. Any other debt known and unknown, gone. Thank you, Lord. This is our day, Lord God. As Jesus is debt free, hey Lord, are you debt free? Absolutely. So am I in this world. Hey Jesus, are you a billionaire? I was that the first first day um, that I started thinking about it. Oh, how much money do you got, Jesus? Trillions upon quintillions and quintillions. Oh, okay, okay. I'll start with a billion. Whatever he is, whatever he has, you're a joint heir of. Think about that. It's already yours. Don't have to struggle, just simply yours. Thank you, Lord. Father, the silver, gold, and cattle of a thousand hills are ours. The wealth of the wicked has been exchanged to us to just. It's already ours. We sent forth those angels from the north, east, south, and west to expected and unexpected sources and bring in the wealth, and it's ours today. Angels, I declare that you bring that financial wealth unto us so we can get the word of God out. Today, tomorrow, all the days of our life and receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it. All those that are listening with the sound of my voice, receive your prosperity. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We praise you, Father, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's have uh, two closing prayers. One, we're going to do the 91st Psalm, which is a Psalm of divine protection for your week, for today, starting all the, all the days of your life, actually. You can pray the 91st Psalm on your way to work as you're listening to my message. And on the way home, you listen to part two. Get that in all, the, all week long. You'll be able to hear the word uh, at least three, five times that week, that message. And the more you hear, the more you believe and walk in. Well, I thought I was a believer. You are. But your mind's going to believe and sight in with your, what your spirit already knows is real. you got to get the two connected together. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. We who dwell in the secret place of the Most High do lodge, abide, and stay under the shadow of the Almighty. We will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, and my God, and Him do I trust. Surely He has delivered me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. 
He's covered me with his feathers, and under his wings do we trust. His truth is my shield and buckler. We're not afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. <clears throat> a thousand may fall at my side, and ten thousand at my right hand, but shall never come nigh us. All with our eyes shall we behold, and see the reward of the wicked, because we've made the Lord, which is our refuge, even the Most High, our habitation. There shall no evil befall us, neither any plague come nigh our dwelling, for he has given his mighty angels charge over us to keep us in all thy ways. They shall bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against a stone. <clears throat> we shall tread upon the lion and the adder, young lion and dragon, do we trample under feet, <clears throat> tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore have I delivered him. I have set him on high, because he had known my name. He's called upon me, and I've answered him. I'm with him in trouble. I do deliver them in honor. What long life do I satisfy them? And I can show them my continued, ongoing, everlasting, and perpetual, and eternal salvation, which is our Jesus. It's our health, healing, wholeness, soundness, deliverance, preservation, safety and assurance, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Hallelujah, saints. Alrighty, I'm going to say a closing prayer over you. Till we meet next week again. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And take this prayer with you as you go over the message daily through the week. Father, I lift all those within the sound of my voice in this room here, the Zoom room, and all those who will be listening to this on YouTube throughout the world later. I thank you, Lord God. And this week, the saints, Lord God, they, when they travel in their home, in their roads, in their car, wherever they are, in their personal person, in their workplace, where they go for groceries, it doesn't matter. We plead and thank you, Lord God, that the blood of Jesus is over us for divine protection. And if we're, it's above us, it's below us, it's beneath, you know, around us, thy mercies, tender mercies, and even your traveling mercies, no matter where we go, are all over us, along with thy holy, big, gigantic angels of divine protection. We thank you, Lord, that we have that. We thank you, Lord God, not only are we safe when we are traveling on the roadside, but we also pray for the unrighteous so that they're not injured, so that they don't come into damage. For even the heathen have been given unto us as our inheritance. And someday, the Lord God, they'll be saved too. So we pray for their divine protection. We thank you, Lord God, this week. We don't walk by what the world says. We walk by what the Word says. Amen. We go by what the Word of God says. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, that we walk by the Word and not by sight. Hallelujah. As we do so, we'll be walking in your provision, your glory, and your divine health, healing, and prosperity. We thank you, Father, for all this by and through the blood of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, as I close here, if any of you have any prayer requests or situation, you may call. You may send a text, you may send an email, and we'll do our best to get you back to you as soon as possible. Or we can share your request if you want it with the other saints, and we can get in prayer and agreement like we did Roger, and Roger's doing fine, and we thank the Lord for that answered prayer as well. So, until we meet again next week, we at Spirit Word Ministry love you. We thank you for partaking your time with us. We thank you that you for allowing us to come into your home. And we give the Lord Jesus Christ a praise, honor, and glory for all of you. By and through the blood of Jesus. Until I see you next week, God bless you richly. Have a great week, saints. Bye-bye now.